Welcome, Melissa. Hi, Mackenzie. Thanks so much for having me on today. I am so looking forward to getting to chat with you today because you have this whole brand new book out. There's lots of things that I want to discuss about it that, that go so much beyond, I think, just what the whole 30 is, which is obviously like a big thing in and of itself. But I'm really looking forward to diving into this and having a great conversation. So as we get rolling, would you like to introduce yourself to my audience? Sure. My name is Melissa Urban. I'm the Whole30 co-founder and CEO and a seven-time New York Times bestselling author. Mostly books about Whole30, but I've got one book of boundaries kind of slipped into oh, my repertoire. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. That is really interesting. <laughs> I will have to go and check that out. That's great. So you're coming out with this brand new book. It's behind you. And for those who are watching on YouTube, it's beautiful. It's giant. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so big because we'll get Get into that, but some of the things that you've added with this version, and you know, we'll get into like the whole 30 parts of it because that's obviously like the whole thing. But I have to say, so right from the jump, right getting into reading the first section of the book that is really sort of about the philosophy, you just head on take on the fact that you have made changes. You've changed your mind about things. Some of that is based on science and, you know, looking into the science of things and being able to evolve what the program is. And some of that is just based on your own personal life experiences. And as someone who's also gone through a divorce and like turned their life upside down and decided like, oh, I can think differently about things. I so appreciated the way that you just took that on and were unapologetic about like, no, I, I I made mistakes or I've changed my mind and that's okay. Like, how did you get to that place of being like, I am just going to, like, this is going to lead in the book? You know, so very, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate that. When I was going through my very public divorce and business split from my business partner, right? My original co-founder, I found myself really trying to put on, I call her Whole30 Melissa. Yeah. And I was Whole30 Melissa for many years. Whole30 Melissa was always put together. She always had her hair and makeup done. She only showed up if she could show up perfectly. She always said the right thing and always knew what to say and never said, I don't know. And I was this very unrealistic and unattainable version of myself really to hide and mask how unhappy and how much of like a shit show the, my personal life was in the moment. And it felt awful. Yeah, I felt like I was living a version of myself that I couldn't even live up to, never mind anybody else. And so when I went through my divorce and business split, it was the most stressful year and a half of my life, but it was also the happiest because I decided from then on that I was only going to show up as myself. I was going to put Whole30 Melissa to bed. Thank you for your service. I understand why we thought we needed you, but we don't anymore. And I was going to say, I don't know. I was going to say this. I was willing to say this is hard for me. I was willing to say I got this wrong and I changed my mind. And so I, I evolved and I changed and I grew and I did a lot of therapy. And I think it was really important for me rewriting the original flagship book nine years later. Yeah. For me to kick it off with that, like why I wanted to rewrite this is because I look back on some of the things I wrote in my original books and I think, wow, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish yeah. I hadn't said it like that. And it's not just that it was a mistake because the science has evolved. It was I as a person have evolved and I wouldn't talk mm -hmm. to somebody else like that anymore because I wouldn't talk to myself like that anymore. So yeah, that was really important to me. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. I just turned 40 this year. And, you know, I look back, I had wanted to write a book when I was younger and, you know, like had my eyes set on that. And it's still something I would love to do at some point. But, oh, man, I'm so thankful that that didn't happen <laughs> about a decade ago. That would have been like, oh, retraction, 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 like, uh -huh. never mind. And I'm seeing this a lot. I don't know if it's I mean, I'm sure as millennials, we we probably did the same thing, but I'm seeing in this Gen Z generation who's kind of there now, like that I've got it figured out. And there's no way to really tell them, like, you don't yet, because we wouldn't have listened to that. Yeah. Like we thought we did know, and that's why we said the things we said. And yeah. it just, it takes age and it takes life experiences to be like, okay, no, never mind. <laughs> 
<laughs> Never mm-hmm. mind. I'm starting from scratch. I don't know anything. And so I so appreciated that you just, you came out of the gate with that. Yeah. It is one thing to say something really dumb and have that haunt you for years and years where you're like, oh, that one time I said that one thing to my neighbor and like, oh, it was so embarrassing. It's another thing to say things that you're not proud of and have them in a New York Times bestselling book that millions of people have read. Yeah. That is a whole new experience. And also, I won't apologize for that because as you said, I was doing the best I could yeah. with who I was at Absolutely. the time and the information I had at the time. And I believed with my whole chest in the mm-hmm. way that I said those things. And because I would say them differently now doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to shame myself or guilt myself for the way that I showed up then. I was doing the best I could. Yeah. And now that I know better, I'm going to do better. And I'm sure if we have this conversation 10 years from now, we're both yeah. going to be saying the exact same thing about current yep. us. Yep, absolutely. I think there'll be a little bit less. Like I really look yeah. back on the 20s. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. goodness. Like, I know. We was... won't be that dumb. <laughs> yeah, we won't be quite that dumb. At least we'll be in this place where I feel like I'm going to look back and be like, okay, you did know some stuff. Like it's mm-hmm. okay yeah. to own the things that you you did have figured out by that point. Like don't don't just be like Miss Imposter Syndrome and like, cannot say yes. anything. Yes. But, but yeah, I think it's so important though to to have that evolution and be able to see it in yourself but then have grace for other people who learn things too like we do evolve and change and there is room for that and there is room for changing your mind you don't have to stay stuck in something forever because you said it once and like let's let's give each other the room to be able to do that kind of growth It would be weird if we didn't grow and evolve. And I think as a brand, you know, speaking not just for me personally, but as a brand, as the Whole30 brand, it would be weird if we didn't change our minds when presented with new information. It would be, I think, a disservice to our followers and to the people who do the program and who want to succeed with the program if we don't give them an updated more accurate, more effective, more accessible, more welcoming version of the program, you know, as we learn new things. So we've constantly evaluated the rules and changed the rules and changed the recommendations and changed the language that we use. And we'll continue to do that forever because that's the right thing to do. And I think that promotes more trust because, you know, we think that, oh, we've we've created the end-all be-all product or system or whatever but I have so much more faith in the companies who are saying like, we're continuing our research. We're going to keep iterating this. We're going to keep making it better so that you are continuously getting a better and better product. Like in the market that we're in today, I think you're kind of forced into that situation. If you're just going to stay stagnant, it's it's going to flop. At some point, it's not going to be relevant anymore. So doing what you've done has made it be able to continuously be accessible. Uh, accessible over all of these years, which I really appreciate. Yes, you are going to be forced to do that as a brand. And as a brand, I want to get way ahead of that. I don't want to have to, because of community feedback or pressure or unsatisfaction, dissatisfaction, I don't want to say, oh, okay, all right, let's go back and like take a look at it again, because that doesn't feel very authentic. So I can point back to 15 years of history with the Whole30, where we said, hey, we put this thing out, we got it wrong, we're going to do it differently. That's just always been the way that we've operated. And I do think it has inspired a lot of trust and loyalty in our community, certainly relatability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting because I'd never done Whole30, but I had friends who did and were very, you know, close to me. I knew they were, you know, we were eating out together or, you know, doing dinners together. And so it was like a thing, you know, oh, (laughs) she's on Whole30. We got to make sure that it's all like kosher with what she needs. So I have like some awareness of it. But it was really interesting as I was reading through it and like getting more into it with this version that you've put out and everything, realizing like, oh, okay, she did it like back to back. It was like she became like the whole 30. That was her lifestyle. But that's not really the way that you have done it. Like it was really interesting in the book for me to hear that you've only done it like eight or nine times over the course of it and that you don't really plan on ever doing it again. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about the difference of what this is versus a lot of these like eating styles and stuff that we talk about that are like, that's the way you're supposed to now eat forever? Yes. 
that's such a great observation and it's something often I find that the media gets wrong. Mm -hmm. Whole30 is not a prescriptive diet. We don't tell people this is how you should eat and our elimination phase is not we think you should eat like this forever. Whole30 at its heart is an elimination and reintroduction program designed to identify hidden food sensitivities. So you temporarily eliminate foods that the scientific literature and our clinical experience have shown to be commonly problematic to varying degrees across a broad range of people. And then more important, at the end of that, you reintroduce those food groups back into your diet one at a time, very carefully and systematically, and compare your experience. So it gives you this blueprint for the foods that work best for you and your unique body and the foods that don't work well for you. And it's meant to be done as that temporary elimination program. Mm -hmm. You're not meant to stay on it forever. It's not meant to be sustainable. And yes, people do multiple Whole30s. And I think there are good reasons for that. You know, first, doctors who prescribe elimination diets often recommend patients do it more than once to eliminate any potential placebo effect. People going into the program may assume that they're because they're eliminating these different foods, that these foods are bad. And even though we emphasize a million times, no, they might work perfectly well for you, the placebo effect is still in place. Also, people do the Whole30, they get done, they now start kind of working their food freedom plan, which is this three-step plan that I've outlined for life after the Whole30, but it's really hard to override decades of an emotional relationship with food and your body and habits and you know, the way that you navigate stress and discomfort and negative emotion, like that doesn't override in just 30 or 45 days. So very often people will come back to the Whole30 when a stressful event or a vacation or a holiday or just the slow slide kind of throws them off their game. And they're like, I want to come back to something that I know makes me feel my best, gives me that sort of reset. That's what a lot of people refer to the program as. Mm -hmm. And then I can come back with even more knowledge about the way foods work in my body. And I'll be even better educated to go create this food freedom plan that feels joyful and sustainable for me. So that's how I encourage people to do the program. Feel free to come back to it. But it's like a safety net, not a trampoline. Yeah. I don't yeah. want people bouncing in and out of it. I would rather you go work your food freedom plan and if and when you find you need that reset again, then come back. Yeah. Well, and I love that idea that that's the end goal is figuring out what works for you individually, because I think we're hearing more and more about how biodiverse we are and how we all have different things that work for us. And so it seems like, to me, I feel like I'm hearing that more recently, but with that having kind of always been the goal of Whole30, it seems like you you were ahead of the curve on that, like trying to find what works for each individual person. I love that it's not prescriptive. It's a way of you looking inward. And I think that I, that's something I want to kind of like shout through this, that people pay attention to that. It's like getting to know yourself and what you need. I would say, I would kind of equate it to like therapy. <laughs> if you go to therapy, you're figuring out what you specifically need to work on, what your traumas are, whatever, you know, this is that same situation with your body, figuring out what is going to work for you so you can make a plan that you feel the best and you're able to work forward on. Exactly. And, you know, I think for so long... Okay, I have a very needy dog underneath here. So if you <laughs> see my arm flying up, it's because he's nudging me for pets. Okay. For a very, very long time, we have been told, especially women, that we cannot trust ourselves. We've been told by the diet industry, by the patriarchy, by stereotypically rigid gender roles, maybe by religious influence, certainly by the media. And we have inherently ignored the signals that our body is sending us. We believe mm -hmm. we can't be trusted. And then because we've weight loss dieted for such a long time, and that's all we've sort of known when our body says, Hey, you're hungry. We've said, no, no, you're not. No, you're not. We're dieting. Or we've used all our points for the day or we're out of macros or whatever it looks like. So the whole 30, yes, is about bio-individuality because there is no one size fits all when it comes to diet. And that makes sense to a lot of people, but it is also about empowering people to restore that trust in yourself so that no matter what the next, you know, article in Time Magazine or influencer on social media tells you about whether this food is toxic and poisonous or a superfood and everyone should be eating it, you can say, I know how this food works for me and I'm confident in my choices and I'm confident that I'm making the choices that are right for me. And you don't have to let all of that noise in because that can feel really overwhelming and it can absolutely steer people off in directions that don't serve them. 
Yeah. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I, what you're saying about us as women, like not validating what we feel about ourselves. I think that is such a learned skill that we need to put back into practice of like listening to your body. I remember when I was giving birth to my second son and the first, my first son I'd had in the hospital with a doula, but like didn't have very good preparation. (laughs) I like didn't know what I was doing. And then by the time I had my second son, I had done a lot more research in different classes. And I remember they kept telling me, listen to your body, listen to your body. And in my first birth, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, what does that even yeah. mean? Like, I, I've i never listened to my body. Like, I'm just existing here. Like, I don't even know. But then with the second time around, it was like, oh, so you mean like, if I move a certain way, then it's going to feel different and I'll be able to tell like what's going on. And it was such a foreign concept that I think we don't emphasize enough in our culture of actually thinking, like sitting down and thinking about like, well, how do I feel? (laughs) Like, am I more tired? Am I, you know, whatever. And sometimes it takes keeping track of those things or doing something really drastic to even notice those things in your body or to see a difference. Yes. Women have been conditioned to put other people's needs and comfort and feelings ahead of our own. So we do tune those signals out. And then there are also a lot of factors that get in the way from our bodies giving us clear signals. As an example, if we're eating a lot of ultra processed foods that are really sugary and saltier and fattier than whole foods, you know, our body may say you're hungry, you're starving, you need to eat, but you may just have low blood sugar, or you may be eating a hyper palatable ultra processed food that bypasses those satiety signals. So I think there are a lot of reasons why the signals our bodies have been sending us may have felt untrustworthy. But yes, we encourage people through the whole 30. And there's a lot of habit research and behavior change research, and even the research of addiction and recovery built into the program we encourage people to stop and check in with your body and say, how does this feel? We give you different metrics that you can measure over the course of the day that have nothing to do with the scale, your Mm -hmm. energy, your sleep, your cravings, your mood, your focus. And what we discover is that people by the maybe 10th or 12th or 14th day of the whole 30 elimination phase, they will say, I didn't, I've heard this so many times, I didn't know that it wasn't normal for your stomach to hurt every time you ate. Every time I ate, my stomach hurt. And I just thought that was normal. And now it doesn't hurt anymore. And it's like, oh my gosh, I can exist like this. So there's a huge level of awareness that comes with a program like Whole30 that can help you tap into that checking in with your body part. Yeah. And I really like too, so many things that I want to bring up. Like where do I I start? But that you, it's not about restricting amounts of food. Like, yes, you are restricting the kinds of foods that you're eating, but you're not taking away from the quantity. Like you, you really seem to emphasize that in the book, like, yeah, eat until you are full. Like, and that's another listen to your body thing, but you're not trying to starve yourself on this. That's not the point. This isn't a weight loss diet. Correct. On the Whole30, you will not count calories. You won't restrict calories. You won't track or weigh or measure your food. There's no portion control. There's no macros. There's no points. There's no fasting. We don't talk about meal timing. We want you to eat to satiety and learn to trust the signals that your body is sending you. I'm hungry. I'm just having a craving. I'm full and I can stop eating. And so over the course of your whole 30, many people find that again by like the second week, those signals are coming through loud and clear. And because you are eating when you are hungry, you know, you should never be hungry on the whole 30, whether it's a meal or a snack or a mini meal, people find that their energy stays up, their focus stays up, their mood stays up because you're not calorically restricting. Yeah. I love that. And I thought it was really interesting too, that, you know, it's been listed as one of the worst weight loss diets and you're going like, well, that's not even the point, but I have a lot of respect for the fact that even in the exit surveys, you don't ask for how, if people have lost weight or anything like that could have so easily been like, well, we could, it's not the point, but we could just slip that in there. And like, at least it, yeah. it would be one more thing we could say, but you guys have really completely avoided that and said, no, that's not the point. And so we're not going to emphasize that by even, even trying to gather any data on it. Yes, we used to. In the earliest days of Whole30, I used to. And I used to share a weight loss statistic. Um, in I think in my first book, I shared one. But over the course of the years, I realized that it 
you know, it it might sound like we're sort of talking out of both sides of our mouth, right? We're saying this isn't a weight loss diet. It's not about weight loss. It's about identifying the foods that work best for you. And also most people lose weight on the program. And it's like, well, that's sending mixed messages. So we stopped posting before and after bikini clad photos. We stopped asking about weight loss. If people want to share their weight loss as a result of their whole 30 story, we affirm that. It, I believe that you have whatever the right to do with your body as you choose. I respect that. I honor that. If you want to lose weight and you're proud of that weight loss, I will 100% affirm that. We're not going to ignore it or pretend like that doesn't exist. But you're not going to see that coming from us, the brand. We will not showcase that because we will focus on the non-scale victories that are most important to the Whole30 process from our perspective. Yeah, I love because it makes it more about your health. Mm -hmm. It makes it more about how you're actually feeling and doing. And I, it's nice to see that kind of transition, I think, happening in a large way in our culture, that people are more focused on the health than on the numbers. But I I really love that about your program. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you've made some big changes (laughs) between the last time you wrote this book and when you updated it. So one of the big ones is you added in a plant-based version. And I got to say, okay, where is the book? It's down here on the floor. I'm going to show because (laughs) for people who are watching this on YouTube, it is, it is a tome. Like this puppy (laughs) is big, but I really respected the fact that this much of the book is all about the plant-based. Like it is literally equal to what you have for the original diet that you talk about emphasizing. And this is a big departure for you from the first book. So talk to us about that. Yeah, this is one of those things where I'm like, oh, past Melissa. You know, (laughs) I was a vegetarian in college in my early 20s for a while, and that suited me. It was not for ethical reasons. It was just because I didn't like the taste or texture of meat. But when I started- You were? Yes. Same reason. Nothing nothing highbrow, just like you. I ate some weird chicken, so I'm going to be done now. Yeah. Chicken. I know. I still still struggle sometimes. Anything like on the bone or anything that's too fatty. But so when I started working out, though, I began craving meat, burgers that I like could not wait to get my hands on a burger. And I thought, okay, I'll try eating meat again. And when I did, I felt so much better and I performed better. And so I thought- Because when I brought meat back into my diet, I felt better. Everyone should probably be eating meat. And that was the assumption that I took into the, you know, when I reviewed the research, the bias that I reviewed the research through and, and the sort of bias that I wrote with. So in earlier versions of the Whole30, we have always offered resources for vegetarians and vegans who want to do the program, acknowledging that you could not do the original program as written without eating any animal protein. You'd have nothing left to eat. However, I would say, here are the resources we have for you, and we would love for you to join the community. And also, maybe you should try eating meat. Like, that was the tone that I took and the actual words that I said even in one of my books. And so, again, as the years went on and I evolved and I learned to appreciate other people's lived experience, I began to realize that I was not particularly welcoming to those people in our community And yet there was still a big demand for people who wanted a Whole30 like experience without any animal products. So in 2020, we began working on a 100% vegan version of the Whole30 with registered or registered dietitians. It launched in 2022. And when this book was getting outlined, I said to my publisher, the plant based Whole30 has to carry equal weight. And you'll find that on our website. You'll find that in this book. It is not a sister program, it is not a like, Here's the program. And by the way, if you're vegan, here's this like little offshoot that you can find in a dusty corner. This has to be of equal weight and of equal importance. So we outline the book exactly like that. And you're right. The sections are exactly the same. They include the same details. The plant-based FAQ is perhaps even more extensive because it's a newer program. The number of recipes are the same. And I'm really excited to position this to the community in the book as an equally valid, equally supported way for you to have Whole30 success. Mm -hmm. I I think that's really admirable. And I love the way that you've done it. I thought it was really interesting too, because you mentioned in the book that it's not, you can't really like mishmash the two either. Like they are meant to be separate programs. You can't like pull from one over here and then pull from one over there. Like, no, you've designed this with dietitians. You've done the science to make these be the most effective as possible. But you really have to stick with what's written if you want that to be the case for you. 
Correct. And again, you can do whatever you want. If you want to create sure. your own version of the high, Whole30 and you want to do a original Whole30, but also eat soy, like you absolutely can, obviously. However, we have designed each protocol to eliminate the maximum number of foods that could potentially be inflammatory while still making the program accessible and give you the most knowledge upon reintroduction about how those for foods work for you. So if you start mixing and matching, you really are losing an opportunity to A, eliminate a food group that could potentially be problematic for you because it is commonly so. And you're losing the opportunity of evaluating how well that food group works for you. So there's a whole page in the book where I answer the question, should I, I do the plant-based or the original? And I give all different kinds of contexts. If this is you, I'd recommend doing the original program. Or if this is you, I'd recommend doing the plant-based. Yeah, I think that's really helpful for it to just be so cut and dry and clear for people. And a lot of times, I think that's that's what we're looking for. We we are told like listen to your body and figure it out and whatever but if we don't have some sort of guiding principle and we just sometimes just want somebody to tell us what to do like sometimes yes. i get to the end of a day and i'm I've had a long busy day and i'm like someone just tell me what you want for dinner like i don't want to make these decisions like someone just do the deciding for me so that's where a program like this can be really helpful because it's like no just do the thing it's already decided Mm hmm. You know, every dietitian in the world will say there is no one size fits all. You have to figure out what works for you. And everybody says, yes, that makes so much sense. How? How do yeah. I figure out what works for me? Because my own trial and error or my weight loss dieting or following the news is not helpful because one day there's a news story that comes out that says eggs are a superfood. And the next day it's like eggs will kill you dead. Yeah. How do I figure it out? And Whole30 really is the answer to how. And a lot of people have said to me, I find the rules of elimination incredibly freeing because elimination diets are to be completed in a strict fashion. Mm -hmm. And it's just so much less taxing on your willpower and executive function to say, I am having no alcohol for 30 days, then I'm having less alcohol for 30 days. Yeah. You say less and immediately your brain goes into like a negotiation mode yeah. <laughs> or questioning mode or like less than what? Less than yesterday? Less than tomorrow? If I have two tonight, but I skip tomorrow, will that work? And it's exhausting. So the whole 30s black and white rules for the most part Habit research shows they're actually easier for the brain to follow. And a lot of people really do appreciate those really strict guardrails for 30 days while they're figuring out how these foods work for them. Yeah, I think so too. It's just like, it's an easier way to just be like, okay, I, I it's just, no, I don't, there is no negotiation involved. I just know this is what it is. And it's only for a certain amount of time. Like Correct. you can, you can get through it. Yeah. So one thing that I thought was interesting in like the rule change section that you go into in the book was the whole idea of the the pancake rule or something like that, where you can like make the fake versions of stuff. And I know we saw a lot of this, especially like when keto really was getting hot and all that kind of thing where people would make these crazy renditions and they're still, you can still find them all over the place for sure. But you mentioned in the book, there's a lot of alternatives on the market now though that we did not have 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It has been pretty amazing to see how many different things with, you know, everything like you were talking about, everything that cauliflower has become and, you know, yeah. all those different things that, that you did restructure that rule a little bit. Yeah. So the pancake rule has gone by several different monikers over the course of Whole30, but it's always been part of the Whole30. And the pancake rule essentially says you're not allowed to recreate baked goods, pasta, cereals, French fries, or chips with technically Whole30 compatible ingredients. And back in the day, these were kind of concoctions that we were trying to make in our own kitchen. We were like, oh man, if I combine like a date and a banana and maybe some cocoa powder, could I make something that tastes like a brownie? Today, there are so many grain-free, dairy-free alternatives on the market. And I love that for people who either can't or choose not to eat gluten or choose not to eat dairy. Love that there are so many options. But part of the Whole30 is helping you figure out how to navigate stress and anxiety and negative emotion and discomfort without automatically reaching for a food and drink. Because so many of us, that is our first and only coping mechanism is like mm -hmm. something's uncomfy. We reach for a food or a beverage. And the whole 30 is like, look, in the absence of these foods, what else are you going to do? You're going to create other healthy 
coping mechanisms for these feelings that will serve you long after your Whole30 is over. But if you can still eat during your Whole30 elimination phase, those potato chips fried in avocado oil and the bread that's made grain free and the brownie recipe that you found online that doesn't include any sugar other than fruit juice. If you're still eating fries and chips and ice cream and brownies and cake on your Whole30, how much do you think those habits are going to change? Yeah. They're not. They won't. Yeah. So the pancake rule is grounded in science. And again, it's the science of addiction and recovery, but it is a very important part of the Whole30. And it's the one that almost all participants reluctantly say, yeah, this rule was like really key to helping me change my emotional relationship with food. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Like you're saying, it's so much more than just a physical reset. This really is a mental reset as well about how you're encountering food, the ways that you're using food. And I, I don't think that if you were able to remove those things, you would, again, be able to listen to those signals of what it does if you don't separate yourself from them. Correct. You know, it's the it's the chips and the tortilla chips that you go through at night and you're prowling through the pantry at 10 p.m. and you're hungry and you just want something that's salty or crunchy or maybe you're lonely or maybe you're anxious about tomorrow. And then, you know, a, a handful goes down to a bag because they're hyper palatable and ultra processed. And, you know, you it's hard to listen to your body when your body is screaming at you to eat more because of the kinds of foods that you're eating. So, and also those foods are going to push vegetables off your plate. They're going to push yeah. protein off your plate. They're going to push fruit off your plate. So it is hard. That part of the Whole30 can be hard for sure, but people also find it incredibly freeing. And what they discover is that yes, food can still be used for comfort in life after your Whole30. I still use food for comfort, but it's not my primary coping mechanism and it's not my only coping mechanism. And I have so many other ways now to navigate stress that are even more effective than just reaching for a food or drink. Yeah, I love that. So there's also some other changes that you guys have made in the new Whole30 that I would say are a little controversial. I know. When like, is this podcast coming out? Uh, I think the week that the book comes out. So is it early August? Yeah. All yeah. right. Let's, let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. Because <laughs> even when I read that, I was like, oh. Uh, I know. I, know. I, don't, I don't know if I can get on board with the seed oils and the MSG and the like, whoa, that's that's some diverted information from what I think we're used to now. It is not necessarily the mainstream. We made, for example, the MSG rule change we made in, I think, 2021, December 2021. Okay. After about a year, I had been doing research actually into this casually for a year. And then we got like really into the research and dove into the science behind the idea that MSG is like a neurotoxin and inflammatory. And in diving into it, I was absolutely shocked to find that there really isn't credible peer reviewed research to demonstrate that MSG is toxic or inflammatory. In fact, much of the research and the original dating back to, I think, the 60s research, and I use the word research loosely, was very much just rooted in racism and xenophobia. Mm -hmm. There was an anecdotal story about consuming Chinese food that led to this diagnosis of, quote, Chinese restaurant syndrome, and then everyone just kind of accepted it as gospel. And when you actually dug into the science, like, no, it's not there. Hmm. So it felt important to me to make that change. MSG used to be one of the additives that we eliminated during the 30-day elimination. And in 2021, we were like, nope, go ahead and have MSG. In fact, there are some really great studies that talk about replacing sodium with MSG can provide health benefits because it offers that kind of umami salty flavor without sodium for people who maybe have to limit sodium in their diet. And we took a lot of crap for it. We did. Mm -hmm. But I felt very confident in the science and very comfortable. And I see now, even though the public perception is very slow to change, even today, I am seeing more and more mainstream media talking about how MSG got a bad rap and like mm -hmm. we did it dirty. And here's actually what the, the research says. Now, if we're talking about like whole foods, though, it's still... It's still not a whole food. It's still something that would be considered processed, wouldn't it? To be it something is. that we would add? Sure. In that like there's no MSG tree that you're shaking it off yeah. of. But my um, Applegate grass-fed hot dogs are also processed. And the applesauce that I buy in the pouches for my kid 
is also processed. I'm not afraid of processed food, right? Processed means that it doesn't exist in its original form. And not all processed foods are unhealthy or have health detracting properties. So I'm not worried about, and we we used to call out processed foods far more strongly until I got a better understanding of what actually processed means and that Mm -hmm. it's not the big bad wolf and the devil. And a lot of the seasonings that we use and the spice blends that we use are also processed. So I'm not afraid of that term at all. Okay. And so what about the oils? Talk to me about the oils. Oh boy. So seed oils, and by that I mean maybe we refer to them as vegetable oils, but it's canola, safflower, sunflower, rice bran oil, as examples, corn oil, soybean oil, have especially in the last, call it five years, gotten a really rough rap, mostly from influencers, calling them toxic, calling them inflammatory, calling them poisonous. And I also, based on the earlier research I did in earlier books, believed that soybean oils were inherently inflammatory. And as with most things, there is a level of nuance required here that is often overlooked when you're talking about like a 60 second TikTok. Sure. And this was an area of interest of mine about two years ago. So I we employed two different independent researchers to look at the current reliable science. And I'm not talking about observational or mechanistic studies, although we did review those. We looked at randomized control studies and meta-analyses of randomized control studies, sort of the creme de la creme of uh, evidence-based research. And what we found there, again, really surprised me in that seed oils in and of themselves are not inherently inflammatory. And in fact, In the literature, most often when replacing saturated fat in the diet actually have health-promoting properties, are protective against cardiovascular disease. And that was not the research that I It's like the opposite of what we're hearing. Yeah. But what, so what we're talking about though, and what we're finding is the context in which most people consume these seed oils or these polyunsaturated rich fats are in ultra processed foods. And then you've Mm -hmm. got a lot of confounding factors, right? Because we know that ultra processed foods also contain higher calories, more sodium, more sugar, maybe more saturated fat in as well. And so in the context of frying these fragile oils, like you would see in fast food, in the context of a diet rich in ultra processed foods in which you've got all these confounding factors, and we know that ultra processed foods are linked to an increase in mortality and in the context of not enough omega-3 saturated fats in the diet, probably as a result of eating a diet that's very high in ultra processed foods. Yes. Overconsumption of these polyunsaturated fats in that context, probably problematic. And it's not just because of the polyunsaturated fats. It's about all of these other factors, right? In the diet. And also because people with that sort of diet also maybe have lifestyle factors. Maybe they're sedentary. Maybe they don't sleep well. Maybe they're not managing stress well. So there's this whole big picture that you have to look at. But in the context of a whole 30 elimination phase where you're eating whole nutrient-dense unprocessed foods, where you're getting plenty of omega-3 saturated fats from the foods in your diet or maybe from targeted supplementation with EPA and DHA, and you're using them in conjunction with other fats and other cooking oils, I don't see a problem with seed oils in that context. Interesting. And we came right out and said it in the book. And I guarantee when it comes out, we're going to take a lot of shit for that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Because there were those things where I was like, okay, okay, we are going in a different direction here. But, but, co- but context yeah. matters and the science is on our side. That's the thing. I'm very confident yeah. in this science. Okay. Well, we got to trust that you're you're doing the you're doing the science work that I'm not doing. So. No, it's not me though. Here's the thing. Yeah. Like that's not my area of expertise. So yeah. I employed independent yeah. researchers and I had a cardiologist, a medical doctor do the final review and the edit of all of the research. Like I employed experts for this. This is not me yeah. trying to figure it out for yeah. myself. Yeah. I can summarize it. But, you know, I I hired the heavy hitters on this one. Yeah. That's really interesting. So what are you most excited about about this book coming out? I am most excited about the welcoming, inclusive, I won't say softer tone, but, you know, I was very famous and the whole 30 has been heavily famous for our tough love in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, that like, this is not hard language. The birthing a baby is hard. Quitting heroin is hard. Drinking your coffee black is not hard. That was the most famous line of the whole 30 up until a couple of years ago. 
And I wouldn't talk like that to anybody anymore. I don't talk like that to myself and I wouldn't talk like that to you. There is still plenty of direct communication. There's still plenty of, I think, calls for empowerment and self-awareness, but the tone is more welcoming. The tone is more acknowledging of other people's lived experience. I feel like I wrote this book with people instead of for people, Hmm. which feels different to me and feels important. And I'm just excited if you looked at the whole 30 in the past and you thought because of the language or the tone or something I said, like, oh, I don't know if this program is for me. I am the most excited for that person to pick up this book and look through it and think like, oh, maybe this, maybe this version is for me. Yeah. And then they get the life-changing experience. Yeah. I definitely think that that comes across very strongly throughout that whole initial section that you write that it's always like, I know I said this, but hold on. If you're still here with me, like stick for this next part and listen to it. And I, yeah, I really appreciated that about it. And I think you've done a really good job. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Yeah. So we're going to move in towards the end of the podcast here. What does a typical day look like for you right now? So I am I'm a Gretchen Rubin upholder, if you know what that means. I respond to inner and outer expectations equally well. So I like structure and I like routines. So I bookend the front half and the back half of my day with routines. And then the middle part of my day can go sideways and like, I'm okay. So my morning routine, I wake up, I sometimes take a cold shower, depending on how cold my water is. Um, I will immediately do some kind of movement session. I'll go for a walk, I'll rock, I'll run, I'll hike, I'll do yoga or work out. I do my post-workout meditation. I come in and I, you know, eat my breakfast and get ready for the day. So I don't do any work or check any email or social media before that morning routine is done. Then during my day, I'm doing podcasts and interviews. I'm writing newsletters or writing stuff for the blog or meeting with my team about the upcoming September Whole30. So Whole30 business for the rest of the day. I knock off at like 5 p.m. I have really good boundaries. When I'm home with my family, I'm home. I'm not also working. So I'll hang out with my kid. We play games. We'll, you know, go throw the football around or have dinner together. At the end of my night, I get myself ready for bed. I do my skincare routine and I always read a fiction book before I go to sleep. Always, always, always. That's how I end my night. Yeah, me too. There's just a way of like, after all that work, you can like totally check out from your own life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's good. It's like a good way to get my brain to turn off if I'm still thinking about work too. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, what is one little way, and maybe you've already told us in telling us about your day, but some little way that you live well anyway? One of the things I, I've talked about once before, but I don't deny myself small pleasures. So the other day I was reading my Kindle and the font was really small and it was kind of hard to read. And instead of forcing myself to read it, I made it bigger. Yeah. Uh, there's this like one, I have two different kinds of forks in my drawer and one of them I like better than the other one. I will always go digging for the good fork. If I'm signing books and my Sharpie's getting dry, I will immediately go pick up a fresh Sharpie. I don't deny myself. If I'm cold, I'll go get a blanket. I don't care if it's hundred degrees outside. I just, I don't deny myself those small pleasures. If it would make my life a little bit better, like I'm going to do that for me. That's so funny. I saw a reel the other day that was like, as we're getting older, like, just do the thing. Like, and it, it, it said, if your Kindle font is too small, just make it a size that you can. No read. way. Like, <laughs> why are you torturing yourself? Just do it. That's yes. So I, I went up like a month ago. I went from three to four. Yeah. And I think I'm back to three now, but like sometimes when my, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it, I just, I do, I do it. I do it, yeah. and it and it feels good. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for my stock questions? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Candles or essential oil diffuser? Candles. All right. Cloth napkins or paper? Paper. All right. City or country? Country. All right. Paper or digital? Paper. Okay. Shopping. Would you rather do it online or in the store? Online. All right. It's whatever time you're making dinner and you need a mental break. Do you listen to a podcast or music? Audiobook. Okay. What I know. I just threw my own answer audiobooks? in. Yeah. No, that's oh, great. I always have an audiobook going. I just finished a romance book called Just for the Summer, which romance is not my jam. And I will not <laughs> listen to another one for months and months because it makes me want to throw up a little in my mouth. It was, <laughs> really, it was like a really, really good book. It was very good. Okay. All right. Chocolate, milk or dark? Milk, I guess. I'm not really okay. a chocolate person. Milk. Okay. That's fine. Sports or no sports? Some sports. Okay. Live broadcasting, like going on 
stories or whatever would you rather broadcast or watch? Watch. Okay. What is your favorite movie? Ooh, that's so hard. I mean, I, I kind of go back to Best in Show pretty often. Oh, that okay. With yeah. Eugene Levy. That one just yeah. never gets old. Yeah, that's a great one. All right. And final question. If you were to put yourself on the crunchiness spectrum, where zero is totally not crunchy and 10 is like singing Kumbaya by the fire with your legs unshaven and dreadlocks in your hair, where are you on the spectrum? Okay. I love this question because I often tell people I'm like, I would say I'm 62% suit and like 38% woo. So I would okay. say on the crunchy scale, I'm like a 38%. Okay. That's a great answer. I've never had somebody answer that way before. That yeah. was great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on today, Melissa. I hope you don't get too much kickback from things in the book, but I think there's so much great in there. I think it's going to be really well received. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thanks for letting me talk about it. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, me too.